Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Calvary. Please stand with us as we sing. depths as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. How, How many, many are your works, works Lord? Lord? In, In wisdom, wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. All the creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. 
When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you, spend, when you send your spirit, they are created. May, May the, the glory, glory of the Lord endure forever. May, May the Lord rejoice in his works. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. Oh, what a glorious day it is, right? And how great it will be when the Lord returns. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Ah, thank you. Thanks, Dave. It's, uh, it's great celebrating our dads, isn't it? And even the reflection of celebrating our Heavenly Father. Um, and all that he does for us and all he has done. And what a great privilege it is for us as dads to be able to lead our kids to the throne of Jesus. Right? That's our, that's our job. That's our purpose. And I know it's a privilege to be able to do that. So, dads, keep going. Keep going strong. All right? And eat a bunch of ice cream. Take a nap today as uh, we celebrate you. <laughs> that might be my plan, I don't know. <laughs> but if you're a visitor here this morning, uh, located in the pew rack in front of you is a visitor card. Uh, if you would just fill that out for us, drop it in the offering plate as it passes by. You're not going to get spam mailed or anything like that. We'd just like to know you were here um, and be able to pray for you. So that would be great. Uh, also, a couple of announcements to share with you. Today is the New Path Pregnancy Center um, baby bottle return day. And if you happen to forget to bring your baby bottle in, bring it in sometime this week and we can run it down to the pregnancy center for you. So um, they, would they will gladly accept it. So don't think that you, you miss the timeline and they won't accept it. 
So if you have one sitting at home, just bring it into the church office this week. Also, you'll notice in your bulletin, uh, we have a Green Hills service coming up on July 10th. And we're looking for some friendly faces just to help out there at Green Hills. The information is in the bulletin. Uh, So if you're available to help out with that service, we would love to have you there. Uh, I know it's been a while since we've been able to have this service with with COVID and different restrictions and stuff. So I do know that the service that they have there is a blessing to the residents. And many of them look forward to it. So if you are able to be there and bless those residents at Green Hills, man, it would be awesome if we had just a bunch of people show up and, and help out there to be the light of Jesus in their community. Uh, at this time, I'm going to dismiss the kids to Children's Church. That's always the part I miss about announcements. So kids, have a good time learning about Jesus in Children's Church. And then as the ushers come, I want to share with you a prayer request. On Thursday morning, Jim Wish had open heart surgery and uh, things went well. Um, but just got a a text message this morning that Jim Wish went back into ICU with AFib. Um, So we need to be praying for Jim. And with Jim, we need to pray for Susan and the family. Um, Because, you know, that can can bring a lot of heartache and struggle, stress. But let's pray for Jim, that the Lord would give his body strength and that the doctors would be able to... uh, Write the AFib to get his heart back in rhythm. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, Lord. God, we give you praise. Thank you for our dads, Lord. Thank you for giving us them. Thank you for giving yourself to us. Lord, you are the Father. Lord, may we as dads reflect you in leading our kids to the throne of Jesus. Father, we, uh, we pray for the Wish family right now. We pray for Jim. Lord, as, uh, he's back in the hospital with AFib. Lord, we pray that you would, you would give his body strength to, uh, to have his heart back in rhythm. And Lord, that you would help the doctors um, to know what to do, what's right, and how to do it. Uh, Lord, we know that you are the great physician. You're the healer. So, Lord, we pray that way, that you would heal him. Lord, we pray for Susan and the family. Just the, the different questions and heartaches that can, can come with this and, and concerns. Lord, we pray that you would give them the peace that surpasses all understanding in the midst of this. Lord, uh, we look forward to what you are going to do in our church in our community. Father, thank you so much for the Kadar family being here this morning. And Lord, be with Lotzi as he brings your word to us. Father, may your spirit fill him and may that your spirit overflow out of him. Lord, uh, may we be attentive to your word. May you be glorified and praised. In Jesus' name, amen.
this next song that we're going to sing might be familiar. It's on the radio a lot, but I didn't pick it because it's on the radio a lot. I picked it because it speaks truth. It tells the story of what Christ did for us and our response that forever he is glorified and we sing hallelujah.
Siastok Yoragel. That's hello and good morning in Hungarian. And I have known this um, young man, I'll say it, I'll say it that way. I've known this young man since for about 12 years, about 10, 11 years now. He's the one that burdened my heart for the, the go on the mission in Hungary. And I've been going there, well, other than COVID, been going there the past, and I'm going to go again here in July. And, uh, He's a good friend. I'm glad to call him my friend, Beratom. He's my friend. So, Lotsi Kadar. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Well, good morning, Calvary Baptist Church. Good Boy, this is a special church for me. I'm not sure if I ever told you this, but this is the first place I ever preached in English, okay? <laughs> Perhaps you've been, okay, really. And since pastor is not here, I can tell you the story, okay? <laughs> it was in 2000, and we were guests of Jim and Sandra Tassel, and uh, there was a missions conference. And we were supposed to set up a table and, and present our ministry. And I said, that's more wonderful, I can do that much. Friday night, the phone rings, and it, it's Jeff, Pastor Jeff, and says, Lotsi! What? Our main speaker canceled. Oops. <laughs> Next sentence, you are it. Oh. <laughs> Boy, I was scared to death. But I'm, and I'm sure that message was probably with this thick Eastern European accent, but thanks God. One of the dear members of that church, because of that message perhaps, came to Hungary and served, served our land. And you know, that led to a wonderful relationship. And, and, and uh, Dave and Ben and many others came to Bible school or see us. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with a ministry report, and that goes with a video first. So let me show you a video about our Bible Institute. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? Is your belief perhaps a product of your tradition or your family background? Could your beliefs be perhaps a product of your culture and where you grew up in the world and how? How well do you know the Bible? How much of your belief system is really based upon the Bible is the Word of God? And have you ever had a time in your life that you could just set aside to get to know the Lord deeper, to spend quiet time with Him? to spend time in prayer, to spend time reading the Word of God? And how well are you able to articulate and share your faith with your friends, with your family, and with others who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ? Word of Life Hungry Bible Institute is here to help to answer those questions. We have three basic things that characterize the Bible Institute here. The first is know, an opportunity to know the Bible in a more in-depth manner know why you believe what you believe. Well, I came here with many, many questions and many of them were answered in a mind-blowing way. Classes like hermeneutics, systematic theology, Old Testament survey, they were pivotal in the way I perceive scriptures. Uh, teachers, um, resident and guest teachers alike, they were always so respectful in sharing their thoughts and making me think in a biblical way. And yeah, that's basically what changed me so much because now I live but I live with questions that fuel my Christian walk towards Christ likeness and godliness and that's more than I could ever ask for. The Bible Institute is also about growing, growing personally in your relationship with Jesus Christ, deepening it that you might draw closer to him. So right before I came to BI I had a very hard time in my life and God brought me on my knees, and I realized how desperately I need God. I strive to get to know Him better and build a 
stronger foundation of my faith yet. I didn't know what exactly to do. And my sister studied here several years ago, and I saw the change in her life when she came back. And I knew that this is what I need. I need to build a stronger relationship with my God. So in the beginning, I was really scared to go to a foreign country, but God took care of my fears. And when I came here, the environment here was very loving, which amazed me a lot. And I was not the only international student, which helped me to overcome my fears. I met many different people from different cultures serving the same God, which were examples for me. God taught me a lot about his faithfulness and that I don't need to be anxious about anything because he will take care of me. Another thing that I learned is that community in Christian life is very, very important. I grew so much in my faith because of people around me that were godly and there were examples for me that were loving me enough to come from me and help me to grow. This whole experience is a once in a lifetime experience that is totally worth it and it's my best years of my life. And then the Bible Institute here is about showing, which means showing your faith to others, being able to explain what you believe why you believe it, and explain to them the hope that they can have through Jesus Christ. Generally, I'm studying in the World of Life Bible Institute in Hungary. We have an evangelistic team that comes to the place of Budapest so we can share the gospel with many people. Budapest is a multicultural city, so we have the opportunity to share the gospel with people from all over the world and so many different religions. We share the gospel with Muslims, with Christians, with Christian Orthodox, with Catholics, with Hinduists, with Buddhists, and whatever else you can imagine. Something that I learned about sharing the gospel is that the gospel is a very specific message, but it can be communicated through different ways. The evangelistic team we have, we go to a place called Deak Ferenster, where many internationals pass through. So in that way, we have a table board presentation that we share the gospel in English. Through that, we can go with them and have a conversation about God, about the universe, about creation, the afterlife. What we find out is that most of them really want to talk about it. And we had hundreds of opportunities, even thousands, to share the gospel with people that never heard about the name of Christ. We live in a world that is looking for answers. It looks in culture, it looks in tradition, it looks in religion. But we know together that the answer is Jesus Christ. And if you would like to know the Word of God better, grow deeper in the Lord Jesus Christ, and have a better skill to show that faith to others, come and join us. We would love to have you here in a multicultural setting, learning the Word of God. Okay, and I have a few slides for you this morning. Uh, first of all, let me show you our graduating class of 2022. We had 57 students from 19 different countries. Now, our ministry is not only Bible school. The ministry where Sandra, my wife, and we are, and I'm serving and our three kids. It's a Bible school and outreach and camping and helping the local churches. But if I may call them this way, they are the, work for, they are the workforce. These students are being trained and they are going to public schools doing sports, music, and they are the ones that are taking the gospel to all sorts of people. And thankfully, after COVID, our ministry restarted wonderful. We are present in schools and churches. We really do a lot of things. But instead of talking about the big things, like the telescope, I just thought, how about talking about the microscope this morning? So instead of the big stories, I'm going to bring you three individual stories, then the fourth one. So next slide, please. On top of being a Bible teacher and evangelist, and doing a lot of things for the ministry. And my wife is a translator and, and uh, she's doing decoration and helping in the office and we are also doing mentoring. So this morning, let me just talk about three guys I'm mentoring. The first one is Gerge. Gerge is 20 years old and he's a born leader. I mean, the guy decided to make a film and he, he was able to convince about 15 people to work for him for free. And he made a film. <laughs> The equipment, everything, he made a film and won some prizes. But his passion is to serve in a local church, to preach and to lead young people and help them to follow and proclaim Christ. And it's just an absolute joy to see a born leader, and he's already preaching in a church, to mentor him and just see where he goes. So that's, that's my first story. And here comes the second one. These two handsome fellows, they are both tall and handsome, Edmund and Jonathan. Edmund, 
on the left hand side, I mean, he's the most passionate evangelist. He's the guy with the most compassion. He's the one who is not only serving gypsies, but he's enjoying it. He's taking all the beatings and ridiculing all the difficulties, the disadvantaged kids, and he loves them from his heart. An amazing evangelist, great potential. And once again, comes to my office once or twice a week, we talk, we pray, I help him, and it's just wonderful to get him ready for life and ministry. On the other side, there is Jonathan, and Jonathan is the servant, is the servant. If help is needed, Jonathan is there. If a sick student has to be taken to the doctor, Jonathan is there. If a team member is missing from a team, Jonathan is there. If something has to be fixed, Jonathan is there. And he does it with smiling and with prayers. And, and for a 20-year-old guy, it's a big thing. He fasts once a week for a day. And once again, a 20-year-old guy who can eat a lot. But he's just passionate. And here comes Sandra's stories, but she asked me to share it with you. The next slide. On this picture, you see uh, six young ladies. One of them is Sandra. On February 24, an awful war started in the Ukraine. That's a next door country to Hungary. A few days later, the entire World of Life Ukraine team, staff, students, volunteers, everybody, mostly females and children, they had to flee. They fled for their lives. Some of these people fled with the clothes on and that's all they had. Among them was Rita, who is standing in the middle of the picture and she was 26 weeks pregnant at the time. Now, when they arrived to Hungary, Delivery started very early. Thankfully, in a hospital, they were able to stop it. And recently, a couple of weeks ago, Rita gave birth to a healthy little boy, Raphael. And Sandra, because when Sandra was 13 years old, she experienced the same thing. She had to flee Yugoslavia from a war. Uh, she became their helper and friend. And uh, this was one of the main ministry focuses of her present, uh, of the past few weeks, uh, months of her life. Now, we are still open for refugees. They are still coming. And uh, perhaps some of you don't know, but Hungary is a next door country to Ukraine. So please pray for us. Pray for Christians and pray for our ministry, and particularly for the Word of Life Ukraine ministry. Now, after the service, my family and I are going to be in the lobby. There's a table set up. And please make sure that you come and get your new prayer card because the one that we just displaced is like six years old. This is a new one. And there is also a couple of projects. If you're interested, you may pick up a flyer and a, and a Bible school brochure. So please come and visit and we can talk some more. But now let's turn our attention to the Word of God, shall we? Right. Do not miss what's most important. Do not miss what is most important. Now that's what my wife tells me when she sends me to the grocery store because she knows I'm an awful shopper. So I go to the grocery store and I pick up all the items that are on sale, although we have like a ton of them at home. And I just forget what's most important, meaning food for the family, all right? <laughs> or I remember one time we went to church with two cars. And uh, two cars, three kids. Guess what we left at church? Yes, you're right, one of our kids. So don't miss what's most important. <laughs> now, we had them all, okay, so... And that's, that's the statement I'm telling my mentees, these young men I'm mentoring, and there are some others. Do not miss what's most important. And actually, there is a thing we Christians miss, although that is the most important thing. That is the one thing I'm telling my students when they first come into the systematic theology class, the most important thing, the single most important thing. And to give you a clue of what it is, let me just read the titles of some popular gospel tracts. Number one, how to know you are going to heaven. That's a good one. I read it. It's a good tract. There's another one. Your ticket to heaven. Admit one. Creative. Good. Next one. The way to heaven. Hmm. Here's the next one. Heaven or hell. Good one, but something's missing. And something's missing not only from these tracts, but from the thinking of many evangelical Christians. And something replaced the single most important thing. And in this message, I'd like to put on your hearts 
on your minds. Do not miss what's most important. And so to get an idea of what's most important, let's turn our attention to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. John 20, 24 to 29. Let me read that. John 20, 24 to 29. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put on your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now we all know, what was the essential thing Thomas missed? What was it he missed? The resurrection. Thomas missed the resurrection. But before we go any further, we say, well, disbelieving Thomas, how about the other disciples? Now I was, I was researching and looking for for some information as in preparation for this sermon, I opened the Gospels, and for my great surprise, I found it 15 times that Jesus, one way or another, talked about his death and resurrection. A typical pronouncement from Jesus about his death and resurrection, for example, in Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And whenever he said this same thing, what was the reaction of the disciples? It was disbelief. They never understood. They never believed it. They just didn't get it. They missed the single most important thing. They did. They did. Even Jesus' opponents understood this fact better than his disciples. Just think about what happened after the crucifixion. As Matthew tells us in, in chapter 27, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said that while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead and last fraud will be worse than the first. They understood what Jesus said, that he he would rise from the grave. The disciples did not. The twelve Jesus picked missed the single most important thing. They did. And once again, before we start labeling Thomas, oh yeah, Thomas was the worst. Hold on for a second. Remember when Jesus actually rose from the grave? Women run to the tomb and run back and tell the disciples, and they did not believe it. Yeah, they did not believe it. They had to see Jesus in person to believe. So they were no different from Thomas. They missed the single most important thing. And us educated 21st century evangelical Christians say, yeah, they missed the most important thing. But we don't. Really? Now, wait a minute. Listen. If I ask you, and you don't have to answer me, if I ask you the single question, what happens to you when you die? Okay, give me the answer in your head. Thank you. Let me tell you what you just said. (laughs) Let me me tell you what you just said. I'll go to heaven, right? Oh boy, you missed the most important thing. Oops. 
Let me ask you again, what happens to you when you die? You say, I'm going to go to heaven. What does this guy from Hungary want to tell me to say? Okay, well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Now, we all know that God created humans for life, for eternal life in a physical body. In the Garden of Eden, there is this beautiful imagery. There is a tree of life, and they could pick from it, and they lived. And if that was not enough, then God created humans from the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of what? Life. Life, life, life. God created humans for eternal life in a physical body. Let that thought sink for a second. We were created for life. When did death enter human history? We all know the answer. When Adam and Eve sinned, that's right. And that was not only their destruction and the beginning of their death, but the destruction of the entire universe. When harmony was replaced with disharmony. And we don't have time for theology, but anything that is not right today, anything that is wrong, started then. Started then. God created humans for life. God created the universe for harmony. And at the fall, everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. But then, at the resurrection of Jesus, everything started getting right. Everything started getting right. Now, remember how Paul says that Jesus was the first fruit? And I know there is a lot of farmers here, so you guys know what I'm talking about. If you have a fruit tree... And you plant a fruit tree in the first year, there is just maybe one peach on it, or maybe two. First fruit. But you know that next year and years after, there's going to be plenty. Jesus was the first fruit of those who rise from the grave. But there is going to be many more. And if I ask you the question, what happens to you when you die? Yes, we go to heaven, but what it is like... And we have some hints from Scripture what it is like. Like in Luke 16, there was a beggar, and there was the rich man. And, and one, once the beggar died, who was godly, he went to Abraham's bosom, the text says. And the, and the rich man, who was godless, went to the place of separation. So yes, there is conscious existence after death, but that is not the final chapter. And that is that we are missing and, and that's why I'm titling this message, Do Not Miss What's Most Important. Because yet, when we die, there is the so-called intermediate state. Like when Jesus tells to that criminal on his side that repents, that yes, today you shall be with me in paradise. Probably you recall the story, right? But that's not the end of it. It's not like, you shall be with me in paradise forever. No, 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 no. You shall be with me in paradise till the bodily resurrection. Oh, and there is another one. Stephen, first martyr of the church, who was stoned for his faith. He prays, Lord Jesus, take my soul to yourself. So Stephen know that at the moment of his death, his soul would depart to be with God. But that's not the final chapter. You know, the common Western thought that says that we die and we fly up and we're going to sit on a cloud and just play a white guitar like Elvis Preston in Best Day, you know, just... That's, that's not what the Bible says. Yes, there is a conscious intermediate state when you exist. But you may call it as a waiting room, a nice waiting room, waiting for the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. So where does this sometimes false idea of heaven come into Christian thinking? Well, believe it or not, it comes from Greek philosophy. Plato, in the first century, a Greek philosopher, 
He believed that there was a higher state of existence, the world of ideals. And the, the goal of human existence is to escape this world and to enter into this reality of higher existence. The, the, the world of ideas, the world of non-physical. And then early church fathers, and I have a long list here, and if anybody wants to get bored, I can read it, but I'll skip it. Early church fathers took the idea. They said that Greek philosophy was preparing the way for the gospel. They said that Greek philosophy for the Greeks was like the Old Testament writings for, for the Jews. And the most proponent of all these philosophers and theologians was Augustine or St. Augustine, who wrote this, that he thanked God that he had first met Plato, for if he had not, he would probably never have received the gospel. And with him start this spiritualizing heaven, I go and go, I die and go to heaven, and with him starts the, sorry to say that, the decline of the central idea of our faith, which is the resurrection. And that's what I'm asking you, asking myself. That's why I'm asking all my students, all the guys I'm mentoring, do not miss what's most important. And what's most important is the bodily resurrection. Is the bodily resurrection. Because, friends, brothers, sisters, the idea of a resurrected universe is the overarching theme of the Bible. It's not that I die and I go to heaven and I'm going to this very strange, different white place forever. No, 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 no. The story goes like that. What went wrong at the beginning, God is going to restore. What went wrong, that death entered the universe, God is going to fix it. With the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what went wrong, that there is disharmony in creation. That farming is hard work. That there is tornadoes and the wars and all, all the bad things. God's going to fix it. There's going to be a fixed, a redeemed, a saved new reality, a saved universe. And that is the big overarching theme of the Bible. As Paul says in Romans 8.20, the created world was made vanity. The universe is subjected to entropy, but God is going to fix it. See his words. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits, listen to this, waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, the beginning of the story, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the first step in resurrecting believers and then resurrecting the universe. I wish I could rename these, these, these tracts. And instead of asking questions like, are you sure you're going to heaven? You'd ask the question, are you sure? you'll be part of the resurrection of the church. Because that's our blessed hope. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17 write about. That's what the apostles preached in the book of Acts. That was the message of Jesus, the resurrection that the disciples did not get. And that is the message I need to proclaim. And that is the message our students have to proclaim, that Jesus died for sins and rose from the grave and those who believe in him will be risen in a glorified physical body. The resurrection. That is what waits for us after death. Yes, there is an intermediate state. Yes, there is a time of waiting. Yes, we'll be with God. No more pain, no more suffering. But then come the body, the resurrection. That is what we so often miss. As one theologian said, the proper and legitimate hope of the New Testament eschatology is the resurrection of the body and the renewal of creation. And you know, this contrast, as he says, with the idea of going to heaven, 
which has often been the mindset of Christian hope in the church. And you know, with all this being said, the question always arises, what should I do with that? And for that, I think I have two or three answers. The first one is I have to make sure my thinking is correct. My thinking about the future is correct. That when I think about what comes next, when I think about all those who deceased in the Lord, my thinking is correct. That I know that their non-material aspect, their soul, some say their spirit, is now with Jesus waiting for the resurrection. And yes, you may call it heaven, but then it's heaven chapter one. Because heaven chapter two, the real blessing comes after the buzzed resurrection. So my first suggestion is this, do not miss the most important for yourself. Make sure that the teaching of the New Testament is that after death come the intermediate state, but that is just a preparation and waiting for the body to resurrection. Step two, how do I communicate? What do I tell others? I'm interacting with somebody else. Um, sadly, funerals are probably the best times to talk about even things like that. I talk to a relative, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor, a fellow student, whoever I'm talking about, I should say the right thing. I should say what the apostles proclaimed. I should say what the Bible teaches. That is, that those who believe in Jesus Christ will be risen for eternal life. Will be risen in a bodily way, in a glorified body. Now, what will that be? I don't know. All I know is this. There's not going to be, for example, glasses. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, I do have hair, but perhaps some, there are some people who do not have hair, okay? And I'm not looking at anyone, I'm looking at the ceiling. <laughs> you will have hair. <laughs> Perhaps there is somebody who is, is, you know, diabetic. Forget about that. You're going to be you. But without sin, without the effects of sin. No anger. No worries. No grieving, no lying. What went wrong at the beginning will be rooted out. You will be truly and genuinely and forever human as God designed it. But you're gonna be you. So if you're tall, you'll be tall probably. If you're not that tall, you'll not be that tall. I don't think if you are 82, you'll be 82 forever. Okay, so don't worry about that. But you will be whom God always intended you to be in the restored universe. So that's my second hint. Proclaim the biblical message. Do not miss the most important thing. Proclaim the resurrection. And I know it's so hard to believe. We all die one day, but God is going to raise us. But that is what the New Testament teaches. Do not miss what's most important. So yes, we may talk about heaven, but then let's explain what heaven is. It's not a bodiless, white clothes, non-physical existence, forever playing guitars. No, 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 no. Heaven is what waits for us in the renewed universe forever. That's what heaven. And praise be to Jesus that it is ours. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Father God, we do not want to miss what's most important. And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The miracle of miracles. And because he's risen, we who believe in him and we who follow him will be risen one day as well in glorified, sinless, physical bodies. And we'll be part of the glorified, physical, sinless universe that you redeemed. Did not deserve it. 
You gave it as a gift. Thank you that the Bible teaches us how to believe correctly. But thank you also that the Bible teaches us what to proclaim properly. We do not want to miss the main thing. We want to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We want to make sure that people understand that this resurrection then be theirs if they trust and believe in his death and resurrection. In the name of Jesus we prayed. Amen. Lotzi mentioned this in his message, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, and we'll leave with this encouragement. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Lotzi, praise the Lord for that message. Thank you. Go with the hope of the resurrection. You're dismissed. Amen.